Good evening, my dear citizens. I want to begin by thanking you for inviting me to come all this way into the American West to speak with you tonight. As was just mentioned in the introduction, although I purchased the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon Bonaparte in 1803, thus doubling the size of our republic with a single stroke of my pen, the fact is I never traveled more than 75 miles west of my birthplace in Virginia. I'm regarded by historians as the foremost architect of our westward expansion, but I was never able to disengage myself from the disagreeable burden of politics to come out into the American West to see it. I did, however, send my protege and friend Meriwether Lewis here in 1804, and he reported extraordinary fertility in the, the Missouri River Valley. Before I begin, I want to quibble just a little bit with that um, generous introduction of me, which said that I'm so important to you. I don't actually think that that's probably true. Um, my favorite principle of all of the principles of my life was written in a letter to James Madison from Paris in 1787. For five years, I served as the American minister to the court of Louis XVI and followed Benjamin Franklin as the ambassador to France. And while I was in France, I saw the collapse of French culture and the coming of the French Revolution. And I wrote a series of letters to Mr. Madison, my principal collaborator and closest friend, about what had broken down in French culture and how it applied to our own situation in the new world. And in one of those letters I said this, the earth belongs to the living generation. The earth belongs to the living, not the dead. The dead have no rights. The dead belong to a, a time that could not have anticipated the future. And so we mustn't, in America, the most experimental of all nations, we mustn't lock ourselves into an undue reverence for the past. Later on, I said, in a letter to fellow Virginian Samuel Kirchival, we may as well require a man to wear the coat that fitted him as a child as to require our civilized citizens to live under the regimen of their barbarous ancestors. I'm afraid to say I belong to that barbarous ancestry, and in coming to you in the 21st century, it's not at all clear to me that I have anything meaningful to say to you. I will do my best, of course, but I do strongly believe that the Founding Fathers, of which I was a modest representative, had their time to create our Constitution and to, to begin the, the experiment of this Republic, but we have all passed from the scene. And I lived in what you would call a three-mile-per-hour world. Nothing moved faster than that. If Moses or Socrates had come to Monticello, they would have recognized the agricultural practices as unchanged for millennia. If Napoleon had wanted to invade the United States, as some thought he, he did, he would have had to mass troops on the, on the European shores, and by the time they crossed the Atlantic Ocean in six weeks or eight weeks or 10 weeks, they would have been weakened by hunger and brought low by scurvy, and we could have clubbed them to death at the shore. You live in a world so breathtakingly different from the one that I represent that it's not certain to me that I or my generation have much to teach you. I think that this country would be more or less what it is if I had never been born. When I, late in life, wrote my own epitaph, I designed a plain obelisk. I'm very fond of the obelisk as a form. And on it I said, here lies Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, the author of the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty, and the founder 
of the University of Virginia. Those three achievements and none other, not my two terms as the third president of the United States, not my single term as the vice president in the Adams administration, not my time as the governor of Virginia during the last phases of the Revolutionary War, not my, my tenure as the first secretary of state for George Washington, or for that matter, my time as the ambassador to France. I wanted to be remembered for three things only, the Declaration of Independence, the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty, which separated church and state, and a university which I created in my retirement, the University of Virginia at Charlottesville. And even those things probably would have come to pass without me. The Declaration of Independence certainly would have been written by somebody else. Uh, it was regarded as so unimportant that it was assigned to me. Um, I was just 33 years old at the time. I was the youngest member of the Virginia de delegation to the Second Continental Congress. I was the shyest man, without question, in the Continental Congress. I was a violinist and a scholar, and John Adams later said that in the entire time that I was in the Second Continental Congress, he never heard me speak three sentences together. When it became important for us to declare independence, a committee of five was assigned to this, and I was far and away the least of them. And two members dropped out quickly, and that left three of us, Dr. Franklin, the greatest American, uh, John Adams, and myself. And certainly, Dr. Franklin should have written the Declaration of Independence. He was a world-famous man, a famous raconteur. He had done extraordinarily important things for our colonies in Europe. He was universally beloved. He didn't have a single enemy. But when he was offered the chance to write the Declaration of Independence, Dr. Franklin said this, and I should have listened. He said he would never again agree to write anything subject to committee review. <laughs> so that left Adams and me. And Adams, John Adams, one of my closest friends, came to the boarding house where I was staying in Philadelphia, and he was brought in and he said, Mr. Jefferson, you must write this declaration. When I said that I would much prefer to defer to him, he was eight years my senior, he had played an infinitely more important role in the coming of the revolution than I had. When I offered to defer to him, he said, no, you must write this declaration for three reasons. Number one, you are a Virginian, and a Virginian must be at the head of this business. Adams rightly understood that the revolution was being seen in Europe and to a certain degree here as a New England tax rebellion. And he needed to help us nationalize the revolution. So number one, he said, you are a Virginian and a Virginian must be at the head of this business. Number two, he said, I, John Adams, am disliked and obnoxious. And if I write this draft, the debate will be about me and not about its intrinsic merits. And number three, he said, you write 10 times better than I do. Well, that one is actually true. Uh, I do write better than John Adams. I wouldn't necessarily say 10 times. But he had said earlier that I had, quote, a peculiar felicity for expression. And really, that's the only reason I'm standing before you this evening, is that I have this peculiar felicity for expression. I was unconvinced, but I agreed as a gentleman to, to, to make a hand at, at trying to write the Declaration of Independence, so I did it. I took out a sheet of paper, and without consulting either book or pamphlet, I simply wrote out the common sense of the subject, what any one of you would have written had you been called upon on that occasion. Uh, that took a single afternoon. And then I put it away for a day or two and brought it out and made a few revisions. And then I brought Adams and Franklin in, and they each made some suggestions. And finally, we presented it to the Continental Congress on June 28, 1776. It was laid on the table for the weekend. And then it was debated on the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of July, 1776. I now had one of the most humiliating experiences of my life. <laughs> 
I had to sit in the Virginia delegation and listen to the debate. As a Virginian and a gentleman, I could not defend my draft, but as a gentleman, I could not leave the room either. And so I had to listen to all of the ambitious men of the Continental Congress debate every word, every point of punctuation, every phrase, every idea, even the structure of the thing. And by the time they had finished, they had reduced my draft by one quarter and, in my opinion, had mangled the text. And so Franklin was right never to agree to write anything subject to committee review. For the rest of my life, I had my own version of the Declaration of Independence printed out and I gave it away as gifts <laughs> in the hopes that others would agree that it is superior to the one that was promulgated on the 4th of July. I bring this up because you are beginning several days of discussion of the great promise of America. And in my opinion, that promise is primarily agricultural. When I was invited to come here, I was thrilled there's no group of people that I would rather address than a group of lovers of agriculture and rural life. I always considered myself a farmer first, a scientist second, and a political figure only reluctantly. And in fact, when I stood for the presidency in the year 1800, I was pushed forward by my friend James Madison, who, who desperately wanted me to stand up against the Federalists in what we both called the Second American Revolution. But I did not want to stand for the presidency, and while I was president, I called that off a splendid misery. But when Mr. Madison pushed and pushed again, I finally did this. I said, I will agree to stand for this office on one condition, that I need make no public appearances of any sort. And that's, that's how it fell out. During the election of 1800, I never gave a speech. I never asked for a vote. I never made a public appearance. I never asked for a campaign contribution or accepted one. I just minded my own business at Monticello. And in the end, the country decided that they preferred me to John Adams. And then I became the third president of the United States. I looked on the presidency the way you look on jury duty. <laughs> it's something you do when you're called upon by your community, but it's not something that any rational person would choose to do. I'm so poor a public speaker, when I gave my first inaugural address on the 4th of March, 1801, I mumbled there were about a thousand people who had gathered in the unfinished Senate chamber of the unfinished capital of the United States to hear my vision of this country, and I was so nervous and so certain that I was unequal to the challenge of being president and so poor a public speaker that I actually mumbled my way through my text and no one who had gathered to hear my vision of this country heard it at all. They had to go out afterwards and buy printed copies on the street. So I apologize for my weak oratorical skills. Uh, I'm no Patrick Henry, I can tell you that. But in my inaugural address, I said this about America, and this is before the Louisiana Purchase. I said we have a wide and fruitful country with room enough for the hundredth and the thousandth generation that we have something that no other country in history has had. We have this immense continental public domain. Native peoples, of course, have lived on it, but they lived lightly on the land and they would yield to us as we moved westward. And so when the Founding Fathers looked west of the Appalachians, we saw what we called in Latin a tabula rasa, a blank slate. And we would inscribe on that blank slate our own experimental system of society and government, unique in history. We would create the first modern republic, a nation where people are sovereign, not a king, where people send representatives from amongst themselves into public places to adjudicate their public business, and where we would have the tiniest government 
that could minimally hold our social fabric together on the principle that that, that government is best which governs least. And so we were going to try and experiment an experiment unprecedented in the history of the world of, of liberating people to pursue happiness in their own way with the absolute minimum of government intrusion. Nobody had ever tried this before. People regarded it as a, as a utopian piece of nonsense. But we were determined to attempt it. And I was asked once, I was on the radical end of the spectrum of the Founding Fathers, and I was asked once in a, in a really remarkably insightful letter, Mr. Jefferson, you have given your life to the destruction of the four principal pillars of order, monarchy, aristocracy, priesthood, and militarism. You have warred through your life, Mr. Jefferson, against a permanent military establishment and against an overarching priesthood that would, would cow people into obedience by way of superstition. And you have fought against aristocracy and tried to create a nation based upon merit, and you have been an absolute antagonist to monarchy. My, my friend said, so now that you have undercut those four traditional pillars of order, Mr. Jefferson, what remains to hold your republic together? What's the restraining mechanism? What's the glue that will hold that republic together when these, when these systems of order that have existed for millennia are now jettisoned as they cross the Atlantic to the United States? What's the system here that will, will make this work? It's a great question. And I thought about it carefully, and here's my answer. Number one, we need to divide and subdivide our government. We have a national government that handles national and international affairs, but most, in my opinion, most of our public questions should be settled within states. And within states, we should divide and subdivide into counties and townships, and eventually we should divide everything until it becomes a little republic of 100 farmer citizens. I called this a ward republic. I said, if we could have a tiny national government, I, even as president, I called it the foreign department, and a somewhat stronger state government, and a stronger county government than that, but really the, the, the great bulk of our public questions will be settled in the township or the ward republic, or even what I once called the republic of the farm. I said, if we can decentralize sovereignty and authority in that way, I will say, like the character in the New Testament, nunc dimittis, now you may release me, for my work is done. So the first answer to the question is we need to prevent the accumulation of power in one center. I was somewhat antagonistic to the new constitution of the United States that was drafted in 1787 while I was in France because it brought too much central authority, in my opinion, to the national government. The second answer, however, involves you. I said, as long as the great bulk of the American people are farmers, we will be the happiest and freest and most virtuous people who ever lived on Earth. I wrote just one book in the course of my lifetime. It's called Notes on the State of Virginia. And in it I said this, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, if ever he had a chosen people, whose breasts he has made his peculiar deposit for genuine and substantial virtue. It is the focus by which he keeps alive that sacred fire which otherwise might disappear from the earth. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. In my time, approximately 97% of the American people were farmers. In my opinion, that's about the right percentage. Now you laugh because in your time, as you know, only 2% of the American people are farmers. If you don't mind my saying so, I told you so. When you when you leave the farm, 
and you crowd people into cities, which are so many cancer sores on the face of the landscape, where you create conditions of class struggle and claustrophobia and disease, you will cease to be a republic. A republic requires a very strong agrarian base. Now, I know from the themes of your conference that you believe in your time that you can still reinvigorate that agrarian base even though a tiny percentage of your people live on farms. I'm less convinced than you are that that's possible. The thing that humans must do is eat. You know, there are very few things that we have to do. We don't have to write state papers or, or poetry or play the violin or, or any number of things, but we do have to eat. The primary function of being human is to eat. And he who feeds himself and his family is performing the primary business of life. That's the center of any economy. Your economy, of course, is is dramatically Hamiltonian, but at the center of it, even so, there is food production. And you, in your time, of course, like to, to praise yourself for feeding the world, but it's more important that you feed yourself first. When we have our hands in the soil, it draws us back to nature and natural law. Almost no day went by in my life when I didn't put my hand actually in the soil to grow something. This keeps us humble. The word, the word humble comes from the Latin humus, or earth. Farmers are never corrupt. They're never vainglorious. They're never warlike. A nation of farmers is a nation of rugged individualists who are able to feed themselves and clothe themselves and shelter themselves and gather their own fuel. That self-sufficiency makes them more politically valuable than someone who lives in a city. Someone who lives in a city works for wages and therefore he is in some regards dependent upon that boss or that entity for his livelihood and that constricts his political independence. And so I, I envisioned a lightly governed, highly educated agricultural nation with family farms diffused from the Atlantic all the way to the Rocky Mountains and at some point perhaps beyond. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. And the third answer to the question of how you hold this society together is education. And so it pleases me greatly that I was invited here to a great land grant university in, in the heart of the Louisiana Territory to my old mentor, George Wythe, I said, if you expect to be a nation ignorant and free, you expect something that never has been and never can be in the history of the world. And I said, enlighten the people generally, and every form of tyranny, both of body and mind, will disappear like the fog when the sun rises in the morning. So the answer to the question of why America will work is, in my opinion, threefold. We need to be highly educated. That's still possible for you. We need to diffuse our population as broadly as we can across the land and to try to locate it in family agriculture. And we need to decentralize our political system so that Nebraska, in this case, is more important than Washington and Hastings or Broken Bow are more important than Lincoln. If you can do that, if you can reinvigorate the Tenth Amendment, which I remind you says those powers not delegated to the national government belong instead to the states and to the people. If you can reinvigorate local sovereignty, then I believe you can still pursue a republic in the 21st century. Now I want to tell you a story before I turn to your questions. There are apparently microphones in two places in the room, if you have questions for me, you might begin to step up to them because I'm not going to speak formally much longer. But I want to tell you a story of something that happened to me when I was in Europe. I was serving there as the minister to the court of Louis XVI and John Adams was in London.
and Adams invited me to come to London to meet with him, but in the end we met at The Hague instead and we renegotiated loans for the United States. Well, on my way back to Paris, I was going through the Low Countries and partly through uh, what's now Eastern Germany, um, or Western Germany rather, and I saw from my carriage a, a peasant plowman, a farmer, who was laboring with a very inefficient plow. And it struck me as so interesting that here we were in 1786, the plow is arguably the oldest human tool, old perhaps as fire. I called it the magic wand of civilization. You know, plowing, sedentary agriculture enabled us to create civilization. And so here we were thousands of years after the invention of the plow, and this man, this poor peasant was using an extremely inefficient device. So I thought, you know, what does a plow do? Many of you have farm backgrounds. A plow lifts the earth and turns it. This is a very gross business. It's, there's a lot of friction involved in plowing. You have to dig up the earth and turn it all at the same time. And so this takes an enormous amount of power. But if you can create the plowshare to minimize statistically the friction, you can never minimize it much, but you can theoretically minimize it to the maximum statistical extent. If you could create that plowshare, or what I call the mold board of least resistance, you would be giving a gift to humankind of extraordinary importance. Well, I happen to know calculus. Calculus had recently been invented by Leibniz in Germany and by Isaac Newton in England. And I knew calculus, which was called fluxions then. And so I took a tablet out of my bag and I sat down in the furrow with this farmer and using calculus I worked out the angle of the mold board of least resistance. When I got back to this country I had it built in wooden prototype. You can see it in the Smithsonian if you wish. And I'm happy to say, and I'm sure you are too, that that plowshare design, the mold board of least resistance, is still being used in your time because it cannot be improved upon. I don't take any credit for this. Any competent arithmetician could have done it because there is a theoretical mold board of least resistance and if you happen to know the math that can produce it, once you have it, all improvements will be in, in materials, not in design. And that in fact is the plow that broke the prairies of the Louisiana Purchase. It's the plow that is still used in your time. I died bankrupt. I died helplessly in debt, $108,000 in debt, which would be about $9 million in your currency. And I was broke all of my life. I spent more than I took in every year of my life. And like all farmers, I hope for bountiful crops and good prices. I should have patented that plow. If I had patented that plow, I would have lived in comfort. But I didn't, and here's why. You're talking about the future at this conference. I believe that ideas belong to the world, that we must always envision a better world. When I was in retirement, I received a letter from a man named Charles McPherson asking me about patents, and this is what I said. He who takes an idea from me informs himself without disinforming me, just as he who lights his torch from my candle illuminates himself without darkening me. You see? He who takes an idea from me informs himself without disinforming me, just as he who lights his torch from my candle illuminates himself without darkening me. And therefore, if I discover a better plowshare, what I've really done is uncover it. And once it is uncovered, in my opinion, it belongs to mankind. And if I monopolize it for my own profit and prevent farmer A or farmer Z from having that efficiency, then his life is shorter and he has less time to write poetry or less time to educate himself or less time to participate in the school board. 
And so ideas that help the world belong to humanity, and we should either have no patent system, or if we do, we should have one that is severely limiting so that the person gets a short monopoly to encourage more invention, but one that does not prevent that invention from ameliorating the condition of mankind. That's my principle. The principle of the Enlightenment is to ameliorate the condition of mankind. And that plow, I'm happy to say, became an important part of the destiny of the Louisiana Purchase, including Nebraska. Let me say one more word. In 1816, Virginia began to consider revising its constitution. And a man named Samuel Kirchival wrote to me and asked me for my opinion, because I was now a venerable member of the founding generation in retirement at Monticello. And this is what I said. I encourage constitutional revision. We must always look to the future and, and not to the past. I said, some men look on constitutions with a kind of sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. They ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human and assume what they did to be beyond amendment. I said, I knew that generation well. I lived in it. It deserves well of its country. But 40 years of experiment in government is worth a century of book reading. And that's when I said, we may as well require a man to wear the coat that fitted him as a child as to require our civilized citizens to live under the barbarous regimen of their ancestors. And so I'm forward-looking. And you should be forward-looking. The best of American history is yet to come as long as you maintain a fundamental commitment to rural life. The minute you abandon rural life, America will cease to be the most interesting experiment in the world and will become just another nation. I feel that exceedingly. And so I hope that the work that you do will find creative ways to reinvigorate rural Nebraska, the rural Great Plains, rural America, so that you will always have a backbone at least of family farmers who can remind the rest of the people what's really at stake in a free society. So, having said that, I would now like to do something I never did in the whole course of my life, um, conduct a brief presidential news conference. <laughs> I do so with enormous hesitation, but if you go to the microphones, or perhaps people will come to you, I will take questions. Who would, who would like to ask the first question? Yes, go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And my name is Mark Gustafson, by the way. But thank you very much, sir, for uh, coming in and putting, uh, stepping uh, on the, uh, the land that you bought for us so many years ago. We really appreciate that. Um, right behind you is a sign that says Stepping Beyond Boundaries. And you, you kind of answered my question a little bit um, uh, in your very last statements, but um, you, you did that in a sense literally when you sent your friend Meriwether out into to what became the Louisiana uh, Purchase, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your thought processes uh, in making that decision to, first of all, send uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition out, but also in uh, purchasing the land. Now the, the question is, is about the Louisiana Purchase and then sending explorers out to take a look at it. Well, I, I have to admit that I did not seek the Louisiana Purchase. When I became president, the boundary of the United States was the Mississippi River, and we were quite happy with that. It was in that context that I spoke of room enough for the hundredth and the thousandth generation. Uh, thanks to George Rogers Clark, our westward boundary was deep into the interior, but there was a crisis soon after I became president because the Spanish and the French controlled the west bank of the Mississippi and they were trading it back and forth and whichever nation owned it could squeeze our commerce by shutting the Mississippi and they were doing it. The Spanish would close the river for a time and the French would close the river and already three-eighths of our commerce found its way to market through the road of the Mississippi. In, in our era, rivers were roads and roads were rivers. 
And so whoever controlled the mouth of the Mississippi could literally control the economic destiny of the United States. So I was under enormous pressure from the West to do something about this, and I sent Monroe, James Monroe, one of my protégés, off to Paris to work with Robert Livingston, and we authorized him to spend $6 million to buy the village of New Orleans. If we could buy New Orleans or another port of deposit in the lower Mississippi where we could station troops, we could probably keep the Mississippi River open. And so we were going to spend $6 million for the village of New Orleans. Well, Napoleon, in arguably the strangest counter-offer in human history, instead of selling me New Orleans for $6 million, offered to sell me the Louisiana Territory for $15.6 million. So I bought 575 million acres for three cents per acre. With a single stroke of my pen, I bought 828,000 square miles for three cents per acre. Now, technically, this was unconstitutional. But we overcame our scruples because we realized how we realized this, that this was the making moment of American history. We were not going to be like Europe, where there would be a Portugal and a Spain and a Germany and a France, and they would all be at each other's throats fighting border wars and wars of religion and so on, that we would be a continental nation, what I called an empire for liberty such as the world has never previously seen. And so I didn't seek the Louisiana Purchase, but the minute it came to me, I accepted it with alacrity. I did try to write some constitutional amendments to authorize it, but in the end they were not necessary. But when I bought the Louisiana Territory, I have to say I literally didn't know what I had purchased. No one had been deep into the interior of the continent before. And so I sent a trusted and beloved protege, Meriwether Lewis, who had lived with me for two years in the White House up the Missouri beginning in 1804. And in fact, he had his first encounter with Indians right here in today's Nebraska. It was Otos and Missouris. Um, and he had an extraordinary success. He traveled 7,689 miles. He met more than 50 Indian tribes, speaking uh, several dozen different languages. 24 of those tribes had their first contact with a civilized man. Uh, when the Lewis and Clark expedition reached them. He discovered 175 plant species that had never been cataloged before, 122 animal species, including the bighorn sheep and the mule deer and the pronghorn antelope and the um, prairie dog. That was an extraordinarily successful expedition. And it was the beginning of what I thought would be a very long process of settling the West. I thought first we would engage in the fur trade with the native peoples, and this would take 50 or 100 years. And then we would send out the first pioneer villages, and, and I hoped that we would, we would move westward compactly and not in some sort of a pell-mell fashion. And I actually wrote something in 1784 called the Bill for the Government of the Western Territories, and I laid out new states in the interior. I thought what we should do is fill the first 13 states and then and only then cross the Appalachians and fill the next tier. And I laid out 14 new states in the Ohio Valley and gave them names, a little east of here. But here's what I wanted to do. And I have a little quibble, I'm afraid to say, with Nebraska. I wanted the new states to be identical in size and perfectly square. <laughs> you laugh, but if you look at Colorado, or Wyoming, or Four Corners, you see the Jeffersonian principle beginning to take effect. I wanted perfectly equal states so there wouldn't be the problem of Rhode Island v. Virginia. You know, Virginia is vast, Rhode Island puny, and that almost prevented us from having a constitution in 1787. And so I thought as long as we have the West and it's yet uncharted, let's create perfectly square, identically sized states all the way out. If you had followed that rational advice, there'd be 64 states west of the Appalachians, and they would all be about the size of Indiana and Ohio, but square. Don't you think that would be a better America? <laughs> and here in Nebraska, when I look at your map, 
I have a migraine of irrationality. I mean, I can almost understand the river boundary on the east because the Missouri is of such importance. But that pathetic panhandle, you should square that off somehow and give it to somebody else. Or I believe very strongly in this principle. And you laugh at this. It sounds whimsical to you, but remember that when you, when you rise above Nebraska and look down on it, what you're seeing is that beautiful, perfect patchwork of the rectangular survey grid system, which I designed. I designed that at Monticello too, and if you, look what it did. It created this perfect checkerboard for settlement. It would have been so easy to follow that up with square states. And I also suggested to George Washington that now was the time to create a decimal metric system. I said, if we don't do it now, we will never do it. And so I wish you had followed this advice. As long as I'm complaining, I want to say two things about Lincoln. First, I bought it, but you named it for a later president, and a president whose policies with respect to sovereignty I question. And secondly, I designed the first neoclassical state capital in the country at Richmond, and almost all of them followed that design, and only a few found fault with that classical model, and you are one of them. <laughs> I see no reason for that. And then the last thing I'll say is that if Dr. Franklin were here instead of I, he'd be intrigued by your unicameral system. He was a unicameralist, and he wanted the national government to have a single house, not two. And so there are only a few places in the world that have tried it, and Nebraska is one of them. And so I think he would be intri intrigued. I'm actually a bicameral man myself, but enough by way of, of complaint. Is there another question? Yes, here. Mr. President, Rick Nelson, and you did just steal my last question, because I was going to ask your thoughts on the unicameral as one of the things that kind of makes Nebraska unique. But I would, I guess, follow that up with another question and your thoughts since we're gathered here as a you know, university community and, and the whole setting of your thoughts on the role of higher education in terms of uh, the development and the further development, economic development wise, of uh, rural parts of our country. Thank you. That's a, that's a good question. Let me just say one more thing about the unicameral v. bicameral. I'm intrigued by the unicameral system because, of course, I believe in popular sovereignty. If, if this were the republic, if you were the only people living in, in the Republic of Lincoln, in my opinion, you're sovereign and you have a right to govern yourselves in any way you choose. And a unicameral system is an attempt to, to distill the wisdom of the people in the most direct possible way. And so I'm intrigued by it. But I did say in 1787, supporting a bicameral system, I said, I find that the first distillation of the will of the people, the House of Representatives, is very seldom a distinguished one. But the second distillation in the Senate is usually a, a much more sober and thoughtful distillation. And so the House rightly leans on the will of the people, and the will of the people can be volatile. That's why we have re-election every second year. But that's not always the most distinguished distillation of your will. And so by having a bicameral system where one checks the other, where no law can be passed without both in concurrence, I find that's a check against um, fanaticism that may sweep through the people from time to time when there's a, a national or international emergency. As to higher education, let me say that I'm very proud of the University of Virginia. I designed it in my retirement. It was the first public institution in the world that did not have a religious base. Uh, there were chapels at the University of Virginia, but they were off campus, and students would leave the, the, the academical village, as I called it, and go off to a congregational chapel or a Presbyterian chapel or a Anglican chapel, but there was no religious instruction on campus, and there, because I believe that freedom of thought is restrained if, there is a, if there's a sectarian base in a college campus, and that really that secularization of higher education is something that I take some credit for. I'm fond of universities, but I didn't expect them to be for everyone. My idea was that everyone would get three years of public education at public expense to learn the rudiments of arithmetic and 
reading and writing and so on. And then the best of those would get three years of secondary education at public expense to learn calculus and Latin and French and so on. And then a third distillation would occur in which the, the very best and only the very best went off to university to study anatomy or physiology or physics. In other words, everyone would get a modicum of public education. Some people would get more if they showed special merit and a few geniuses would have higher education. And at the same time, I wanted to create trade schools for agriculture and for uh, shipping and the merchant marine and trade skills because I believe very strongly that there should be higher education available to everyone, but it doesn't necessarily involve the, the more abstruse reaches of mathematics and physics and the humanities. So I'm in favor of, of universities and believe very strongly that they will, they'll have this effect. In a letter that I wrote to John Adams after our friendship was restored, I think this letter was around 1814, we were debating aristocracy. And Adams believed firmly that in every society there will be the few and the many. That there's no, you could not create it in an egalitarian society. Even if you did, soon there would be the strongest, the richest, the most beautiful, the most handsome, the fastest runner, the greatest poet. And so that in every society, no matter how you shuffle the cards, a tiny handful of people will become the aristocrats and then they will have a hereditary function and they will become a hereditary aristocracy. I disagree with that. I think that's a, a pessimistic view of America. And so I said the goal of America should be to replace that aristocracy, which I call a pseudo-aristocracy, an aristocracy based on birth, and replace it with a natural aristocracy based on merit. And the way to do that is to have public education that brings everyone up to his capacity. If you have a, a well-endowed public education system, then you will find the natural aristocrats and lift them into positions of leadership in the arts, in the sciences, in government, in law, etc. But you have to have this principle of merit to lift those natural aristocrats. And historically, governments have not only sided with the pseudo-aristocrats, but they have gloried in pseudo-aristocracy. I said our system should be one that makes life more difficult a little for the pseudo-aristocrats and opens doors for people of merit. And of course, that means, if you, if you follow this argument, that there could be a person in Alliance or Sydney or Hastings who's as important as the person who grew up in Paris or London or Manhattan, that, that merit knows no geography, that people are as often, geniuses are as often born in hovels and wigwams as they are in palaces. And so the great society is the one that finds them out and lifts them. And, and what better lever for that, that great principle is there than the university, than a system of public education? And so then, after my time, when, when the moral land grant system began to really lift the agricultural classes and the rural classes to their proper positions in American society, that strikes me as absolutely the right thing to do for the greatness of the United States. So I, I was saddened that in my own lifetime, Virginia did not have public education, but New England did. New England had poor soil and public education. And Virginia had rich soil and no public education, and New England was out distancing Virginia because they understood the importance of public education and my own countrymen in Virginia did not. So education is absolutely essential to a free society. Is there another question? Yes. My name is uh, Wu. Uh, Jerry Johnson. I'm a proud member of the Nebraska Unicameral, and some of my colleagues are here. One of the things that I remembered from my youth was the symbols that were part of the future farmers of America, one of them being the plow, and the other being the owl, uh, representing wisdom. As you look back at the original document, uh, some 25% of it, you indicated, was removed. Uh, if that had stayed in the document, 
what would uh, America look like, and would it have a positive effect on the future of agriculture? Uh, yes, it would, as a matter of fact. So the question is, if, if I complained that the Declaration of Independence was mangled and that the original draft contained a quarter more, and I'll tell you what was, what was removed. As you all know, I'm sure, I'm a slaveholder, and I own several hundred slaves. I only freed eight slaves in the course of my life. Um, I know that puts me in a very bad light. And I could, I could attempt to explain this, and will if you ask, but, but that's not the spirit of this question. But I wanted the United States to begin to extricate itself from this horrible practice. I mean, nobody can, nobody can defend slavery. It's indefensible. It's a fundamental violation of human right. I tried all of my life to convince Virginia or the United States to free our slaves either immediately or gradually or in some system or other, and, and every time I failed. But in the Declaration of Independence, I had a, a paragraph that accused George III, the, the tyrant of England, of perpetuating the slave trade. What happened was that from time to time, Virginia or Maryland or Georgia or one of the Carolinas would try to restrain the slave trade, you know, the kidnapping of Africans from their native tribes and bringing them in unspeakable conditions across the Atlantic to be sold here to the highest bidder. Once in a while, one of the colonies would try to restrain this horrible practice. And every time we did, the Parliament of England or George III would veto that colonial legislation because they were fattening up on the trade. So I, I said in the, the longest single paragraph in the Declaration of Independence that by, by pro preventing us from restraining the slave trade, George III had, quote, waged war against human nature itself. And I attacked the British Parliament and the Crown for preventing us from beginning to do the right thing with respect to slavery. That paragraph was expunged from the final draft of the Declaration of Independence at the insistence of the Carolinas and Georgia. We needed unanimity. We could not have a split decision. And so in order to get a unanimous Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, 1776, we reluctantly removed that anti-slavery tract. There was an 18-point indictment against George III, and that was one of them. And I desperately wanted to keep it because for two reasons. First of all, I didn't want the world to be able to look upon us as hypocrites who are arguing for liberty and then denying it to Negroes. And I wanted us to begin the process of finding a way to get out from under this thing. I, I later said in life, it's like having the wolf by the ears. You can't hang on and you can't let go. But we had to do something about it in our national birth certificate. And so when this paragraph was removed, it was a heartbreaking thing to me. I believe that if it had stayed, the Civil War could have been prevented. I, you, know, you know the Northwest Ordinance. I partly helped to write it. The Northwest Ordinance pro prohibited slavery from being north of the Ohio River, and that held. In the 1784 Land Ordinance that I described a minute ago about square states, I had actually prohibited slavery from crossing the Appalachians anywhere. But that provision of the 1784 ordinance failed by one vote. If that vote in 1784 had gone the other way, probably slavery could have been kept out of the American West. And if that had happened, the entire history of the country would be fundamentally different. So that's the first part of the answer. The second part is that it would have great implications for agriculture because my brand of farming is not sustainable. It's not an intelligent system of farming. It's corrupt at the core. It's slave tobacco farming. First of all, tobacco is a is a horrible, noxious plant that provides no nutrition. And so to call that farming is a contradiction in terms. We grew it as a cash crop, and we were addicted to it as a cash crop, but it's a, it's a horrible plant that provides no value to humans and wastes soil. It's extremely hard on the soil. So I wanted us to emancipate ourselves from a tobacco economy and create more family farms, which wouldn't need any slave laborers. And so by the extension of slavery in the West, you bring on the Civil War and you also create, I think, conditions of agricultural insustainability. You know, at, at Monticello, I was constantly experimenting with crop rotation systems and contour plowing and shelter belts and so on to try to keep our soil. And, and I meant to say this tonight, and I will just quickly, that one of the problems of American agriculture is abundance. 
know, we had an infinity of land to the west of us. And so in my time in Virginia, it was literally more economically profitable to grow tobacco 10 years in a row on a piece of ground and waste it and then simply move on and cut down more trees and create more tobacco acreage and waste it. And so the principles of stewardship and husbandry and conservation of our resources were no part of our thinking because the land to the west seemed to go on forever and we only had four million Americans in 1800. And so we didn't learn the practices of responsible stewardship because we didn't need to. And that principle of superabundance, I believed would be a, an impediment to America creating a philosophy of proper husbandry and proper stewardship because we would always think there's more, there's more, and there's more. And so at Monticello, I tried these crop rotation systems to ameliorate the soil and contour plowing to prevent the, the, the terrible erosion. It, it rains 44 inches per annum there. But these were small experiments uh, in a nation that was not in any way really interested in, in that brand of husbandry. So, you know, I, I don't want to make too big a claim for the Declaration of Independence, but I do believe that the fact that the Northwest Ordinance held and slavery did not find a root in the West above the Ohio River is proof that if the, if the Declaration had contained that paragraph, it could have, it could arguably have prevented your civil war. We have time for one or two more questions, or are we out? One more. Who has a question? Yes. Uh, Chuck Schroeder. Mr. President, um, you expressed your skepticism early on about uh, the Rural Futures Institute's notion of repopulating rural areas and returning to people to agrarian production, and that, that really is not the objective, but it is the objective indeed to uh, diffuse our population, as you suggested was a proper goal, and into rural areas, and in our case, uh, looking to populate those rural areas with communities that are vibrant economically, socially, culturally. There's plenty of skepticism around that goal. Plenty of folks who think that's impossible. And I think about your time in our history and the number of impossibilities that you faced. You had to face at least as much skepticism uh, with your objectives as we do with this one. Could you talk a little bit about, A, how you faced those impossibilities, number one, and number two, how you built consensus around initiatives to overcome those possibilities that were infecting those around you. Yes, of course. And, and let me say, I did not mean to, to be skeptical about the purposes of your institute. Uh, not at all. But I am skeptical about your capacity to reinvigorate rural culture if you only pursue Hamiltonian models of development. You know, Mr. Hamilton is a genius who would have been a wonderful prime minister for England. <laughs> but he was not a good American, and he has infected you into believing in a profit model of agriculture. And of course, profit is essential. I should have paid more attention to it at Monticello. <laughs> but I'm not suggesting that, that profit is a bad thing. But I think that, and I'm going to speak very honestly here, I think you need to put the culture back in agriculture. Agriculture is a way of life, it's a philosophy, it's a, it almost has a Confucian element of independence and capacity to do a range of things that are practical in nature but take serious skill. And I think that if you don't grow some of your own food, you know, in my time, a farmer grew his own food because that's the only way he could get food. There were no stores in Virginia, so we had, if we wanted wheat, we had to grind, uh, grind it into flour. And if we wanted bacon, we had to butcher hogs. We, there's no way to purchase any of that. We traded some, but, but there were no stores. And so everyone was self-sufficient because we, in a sense, had no choice. Well, in your time, of course, that's not your model. Very few people are self-sufficient, even farmers. But I think you need to reinvigorate that. I think that every farmer should grow some of the food that he ingests. He should spend some time every day with his hands in the soil. He should be hybridizing orchards. He should be growing his own peas. Uh, 
I think growing a tomato for your table is more important than growing a bushel of wheat for Mr. Hamilton's market. And that if you, if you will restore the culture to agriculture, you will find that people come back to rural life. People are leaving rural life because that's the history of the world, people leaving rural culture and, and entering cities, but it's also the case that your, your production machinery and the gigantism, both of capital and of equipment in your time, debilitates average families from taking up land and growing food. And so you have to break the, the tyranny of the gigantism model before you can reinvigorate rural life. In my time, you know, the Homestead Act was sort of on my mind. It didn't come about till much later, but I was thinking 50 acres might be in abundance. Then in the time of, of, of Lincoln, 160 acres was regarded as abundance. And now, of course, in your time, that would be looked on as pitiful. But the idea was to give people a place where they could root themselves and, and grow families and create character and produce an education that doesn't require books, an education that comes from watching the birth and death of livestock and watching a bean plant push its way through a crusted piece of soil and lift itself towards the sun. And that this agriculture was inherently ennobling and people recognized it. And so, of course, you want to limit the amount of backbreaking labor that it takes to be a family farmer. Everyone understands that. But you don't want to do it to such an extent that people are now literally deracinated. They are, they are they're literally, by machines, kept away from the soil. And they don't grow their own food. And they don't participate in, the, in, in, in nature and nature's law. That, it seems to me, is essential. You probably will disagree with that. If we disagree, we will disagree as rational friends. As I said to my grandson, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, when he left the safe environs of Virginia and went off to Boston, I said, never contradict anyone. You will never win a dispute, and contradictions frequently break friendships. I said, when I hear another man express an opinion which is not mine, I say to myself, he has a right to his opinion, as I do to mine, his error does me no injury. <laughs> and so I hope you will regard me as my errors do you no injury. I'm speaking as an antediluvian from the 18th century, but when I spoke of the agrarian way of life, I was talking about a way of life, a philosophy of living that came from deep, localized rootedness. And so I wish your institute well. I hope that you can accomplish what you wish to accomplish, because I think that this will sound perhaps quaint to you, but I can't think of anything more important to the future of the United States than finding a way to reinvigorate rural America. Most people don't see it that way, but I did and I do. And I did mean it when I said that the, the farmer is the chosen person of God and that was the one reason I believe that this Republican experiment would succeed. So we faced these issues in my time. Everyone was uh, certain that our revolution would fail. I actually wrote a letter about this to a friend of mine named Maria Cosway in 1786 and said, you have to balance the head and the heart. If you just let the head decide, the head will always talk you out of everything. I said, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have gone to war against the largest military power in the world if we had used the head. How can a group of ragamuffin Minutemen defeat a superpower? So we let the heart do it, and we won. I said, we would never give alms to the poor on the street if we used the head because we know what they're going to do with it. But we give it to them because it, it deepens our humanity. And maybe one out of 100, or one out of 10, or one out of five will eat a little better because of our generosity of spirit. The head and the heart have to be balanced. The head says, never snatch at the bait of pleasure till you know there is no hook beneath it. The art of happiness is the art of avoiding pain. Of course, but that's not life. Life is generosity. Life is love and friendship and sympathy. Life is a commitment to things that can't be measured in Mr. Hamilton's terms. Mr. Hamilton wants to know the, the, the monetary value of things, what, what's fungible, 
But that's not why you're in agriculture. That's not, that's not the purpose of agriculture. The purpose of agriculture is to create citizens. And in addition to that, to create complete lives where the soul is, is nurtured as much as the potatoes. And so for me, this is, it's a simple thing. I believe you can do this. You, you're the most clever and well-educated and technologically um, sophisticated people who ever lived on earth. And I believe if your heart is still in agriculture, you'll find a way and the barriers will slip away because you will create cadres of well-wishers and supporters of, of the sort that you saw in your ingenious video, people who, who really do understand what's at stake and they will then become models to spread the word to others. And if you do this right, people will leave the Sodom and Gomorrah of Omaha and return to the villages. <laughs> They will leave Lincoln and go out to David City and they will take up small parcels of land and grow a tomato and be happy. Thank you very much. I'm sure, I'm sure we're out of time. I just wanted to break character for a minute and, and say a couple of quick things. First of all, my name is Clay Jenkins and I live in that other agrarian place, North Dakota. Um, I grew up in North Dakota. My grandparents were farmers in rural Minnesota. I'm, as you can probably tell, deeply committed to the agrarian model of life. And I lived on a farm in northwestern Kansas for a few years uh, with my in-laws. And it was a gigantic Hamiltonian Ogallala farm and my father-in-law and I would go out to move pipe. It was, that's how primitive it was. We had to move pipe. And we'd be out there at 108 degrees lifting these pipes that would just be scalding your hand. And we'd, we'd go to these two eight-cylinder engine machines that were pulling the water out of the Ogallala. And he'd be shouting at me across the machines. I'd be shouting back. It didn't feel very Jeffersonian to me. Uh, it felt like industrial agriculture. It was successful, but it didn't feel... And one time, um, I remember my, my mother-in-law lamenting that a, a crop sprayer had destroyed her neighbor's peach orchard. And I said, that's just terrible. And she said, yeah, she should know better than to have an orchard out here. <laughs> and and you know, just thought, whoa, you know, we're really deep in this, this other model of agriculture. So uh, I now live in Bismarck, North Dakota, which is a megalopolis, about half the size of Lincoln. You named your capital after an American hero. We named our capital after a German dictator. Um, <laughs> but I've been so eager to come here. I'm fascinated by what this institute is doing. You know, we, in North Dakota, where I live, we're reinvigorating rural culture, but in the wrong way, it seems to me. It's by way of the Bakken oil boom. And so now, I mean, all these little towns like Crosby and Grassy Butte and, and Watford City and Kildare and Stanley and Partial have been aching for the last 40 years to get some new growth. And now it's just hit them like a sledgehammer. And it's really transforming. So it's rural, but it's no longer agrarian, if that makes sense. And so th that's not the answer, it seems to me. I don't know what the answer is, but I do believe Jefferson's right, that if you reinvigorate rural life, and you know, I heard Tom say in his introduction that young people are going to be here this week, and I, I sure hope that's true, because where I live in North Dakota, it's the young people who are creating the co-ops and the community gardens, and are reading Michael Pollan and doing localism and trying to design a new nutrition for North Dakota and so on. It's not people my age, it's people half or, or less my age who are enamored of that model and there's kind of a, re a modest reinvigoration of agrarianism on the northern Great Plains because of that. So I hope that that's one of the functions that this institute will be able to encourage. But I, I do think that the answer to the problems of the United States are going to be Jeffersonian, that, that the answer is going to be a higher technologically sophisticated agrarianism where a much larger percentage of the American people participate in the growing of some of their own food in some way or other, and that that will really change the culture. <laughs>
and it will reinvigorate places like Broken Bow. I do very, very strongly believe that and would love to be a part of that revolution because I think Jefferson was right that those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. I so love coming here. My daughter for a number of years lived in northwestern Kansas and I used to drive through western Nebraska and I took a different road every time. Got lost in the sand hills over and over and over again. But Nebraska is such an extraordinary state. Uh, you have so many things that we don't have in North Dakota. You know, we're, we're, such, we're so pathetic up there. Um, <laughs> historically, we have Lewis and Clark, who are also here. And we have Theodore Roosevelt, who did spend some time in Western North Dakota. And then we have Lawrence Welk. <laughs> and that's really it. And, and you have Willa Cather and Mari Sandoz. And you, know, you just have such a rich literature. And you have Crazy Horse and Red Cloud. Uh, we North Dakotans, I hate to say it, they will, would lynch me if they knew I said this, but we look up towards Nebraska. <laughs> and you have one of the world's great universities. I mean, you literally have one of the world's great universities right here in Lincoln, Nebraska, and that is such... Uh, that is such an advantage. That is such an extraordinary advantage. And, and I'll, this is, I'll end on this note, it's not only an advantage to have such a great university, but it's also in your state capital. In Bismarck, this is a true story, when the Constitution of North Dakota was written in 1889, they were divvying up the institutions, and Bismarck got the choice of either having the university or the prison. And it chose the prison because that was more economically profitable. And it has been a less interesting capital than Lincoln ever since. I'm serious. Having a university where your state capital is is of such remarkable importance to the way government occurs and how the university crowd can help to shape a state's destiny. If we had a real university in Bismarck, we'd bury you. <laughs> so I wish you well with your, with your conference. It's such a thrill to be here, and I'll see you another time. Thank you.